we've made it to the ninth arcanum, the Hermit, the pathway between Gavira and Chesed. of the Meeb's Tarot. The Hermit is an initiate. The light of this magical lamp should work marvels. It should illuminate the consciences of men and women so that you may read them and should enable you to recognize each type of spiritual being. That's a quote from Elephas Levi. The sign of Arcanum 9 is Teth, its numerical value 9. The astrological correspondence is the zodiacal sign of the lion, Leo. The hieroglyph of the Arcanum is a roof, as a symbol of protection, shelter and isolation from harmful influences. The card represents an old man walking, holding in his right hand a lamp with three wicks lit. A broad hooded garment surrounds the old man, forming three folds that cover the lamp. With the left hand, the old man rests on a stick in which are visible three nodules. The three flames of the lantern obviously indicate the initiation on all three planes. The mantle with its folds in the same way, clearly indicates insulation on the same three planes. The baton with its three knots symbolizes triple support. The pilgrim's age is an indication that only the man who has overcome the storms of passions, the pursuit of personal happiness and the ambitions of earthly life can devote himself to aspects of life as symbolized in the card. Walking indicates that the presence of the elements presented in the card prevents any stationary state. The common name of the arcanum is the Hermit. The erudite name Lux Occulta or Lux in Occulto. Let us turn to the arithmetic analysis. In two digit T construction, we first have nine equals one plus eight. That is, an individualized balanced unit, one, that seeks to manifest itself in the environment according to law, eight. If the plane of this manifestation is that of the archetype, then the human being finds there the idea and the image of the protective genii who help him discover in himself his own higher being. Here comes the first title of the Arcanum, Protector. If manifestation is sought in the plane of man, it will entail understanding of himself, his own astral knowledge and the harmonization of the soul. This process of evolutionary work is called initiation or self-initiation. In the latter case, the protector is bound within itself. Thus, the second Arcanum Titan title will be initiate. Finally, if the plane of manifestation desired is that of nature, that is, the physical plane, then the being learns to face the god of materialists called chance and to orientate self in life through theory of probability that often dictates various degrees of prudence, hence the third title, Prudence. The inversion of the first deconstruction will give us 9 equals 8 plus 1. Here the legality, eight, of the environment weighs on a crystallised but healthy personality, one, and limits it. That personality is unable to circumvent prudently the demands of his environment through internal isolation and rise beyond the dictates of that environment. This is the formula of talented personalities, but drowned out by their environment or time and therefore not influencing the process of the evolution of humanity. The second two-digit deconstruction gives 9 equals 2 plus 7, that is, 
the son of science and the victor seven. Who is the victor? The one who passed through the stages of the first seven metaphysical arcana. And what will the science be? The science of the victor has two aspects, female, passive, receptive, called divinatio, i.e. the ability to see in the archetype man and nature. Prophetic ecstasy, sudden consecration by grace, which gives inspiration for the creation of a religious cult and its morality, will be good examples of divination in the archetypal plane. Divination according to man will, will be reduced to sensitivity in the field of astral manifestations of others, such as watching auras, quick judgments about the nature, development and degree of moral evolution, assessment of the ability of odic emanations, etc. As well as to those systems that bear the well-known names of palmistry, phrenology, physiognomy, etc. and with which we will have to deal in the 17th Arcanum. Divination by nature spills over into forms known under the, under the names of astrology, geomancy and its subdivisions, cartomancy, hierogomancy, poromancy, etc. Fortune telling by the elements, again, which belong to the 17th arcanum, which is the star. The science of the victor also has a male active side, the ability, ability to own the astral i.e. direct and apply the energy of personality in the forms of magnetism, telepathy, transmission of forms to distance, and even the exteriorization of the astrosome, as well as the ability to formulate ceremonial magic to forcibly enter into communication with various astral beings. Many people are attracted to these victor sciences, a field that captivates many with the depth and breadth of its applications, often dangerous, often fatal for its owner. We may ask whether the victor, Seven, might voluntarily renounce his activity and receptivity in its field, cherishing the safety of his victorious personality, and Seven also, putting this personality ahead of the interests of science, which is two, maybe. This will be the decomposition nine equals seven plus two. We pass the decomposition 9 equals 3 plus 6. Metaphysics, 3, is ahead of the choice of the path, 6. Metaphysics, so to speak, determines the choice of path. But what, they say to me, in addition to the metaphysical worldview, can affect this choice? Impulsiveness. We will not speak of the instincts, the physically impulsive man nor of the passions, the astrally impulsive man. This subject has already been discussed and presents no problems. We will speak of an impulse, um, impulsive intellectual man with his superstitions, prejudices and conditioning. The superstitions are the greater impediment to initiation. Let's deal with them. What are superstitions? They are the vestiges, impulsively admitted in a way that once, when the person in question created astral cliches and volitional entities, were necessary and useful, but due to the progress of this person, have become a great burden to hinder or even prevent authentic manifestation, proper and appropriate to its actual, current, evolutionary stage. We can deduce from what has been, been said that all superstitions belong to the astral plane. However, According to the field to which they refer, they can be subdivided into mystical, precisely astral and physical ones. If a person faces conditions of life where there is no possibility of maintaining hygiene and yet strictly clings to some acquired hygienic habit, it can be considered superstitious on the physical plane. The same can be said of a man who, sufficiently evolved to create through meditation, propitious conditions to be able to pray outside a temple made of masonry complains that the absence of it makes it impossible for him to pray. Let an example of astral superstition be the conviction of a magician who has reached in his power the stage at which his ideas themselves are clothed, clothed with astrosomes, 
of the inability to operate without pronouncing one or another formula, without observing one or another symbolism. Another example, somewhat comic and very commonplace, is a person who recognises Monday as a difficult day, or that the 13th day is unlucky, without any empirical data in his autobiography. <clears throat> there are many examples of mystical superstition. We see people firmly convinced that there is no salvation outside the totality of the smallest details of a particular religious dogma. At the same time, we see people who are indifferent to the differentiation of religions, if only they recognise a certain, dear to them, dogmatic element, for example, the dogma of the atonement by the incarnation. We also meet people who demand from religion only recognition of the possibility of the reintegration of mankind through evolution. Of course, a man belonging to the third category will find superstitious another who is culturally similar, but belongs to the second. And a man of the second category will qualify as superstitious to someone who belongs to the former. We can thus deduce that no superstition can be qualified as absolute. To evaluate the superstition, it is indispensable to have an understanding of the mentality, the astral and the physical state of the same. The lack of such understanding has always provoked persecution of the initiatic centres, for they were accused of propagating different dogmas, maintaining various ethical codes and different duties, which, in fact, were in accordance with the initiatory degree of members. To conclude, we suggest a very important subject to be meditated upon. If we acquire an ascendancy over a person who is our mental, astral and physical equivalent, this is almost always due to their superstitions, prejudices or conditioning. Prejudice in the field of citizenship and conventionality in the field of everyday life play the same role as superstition in the field of dogmatic outlook. The inverse deconstruction, 9 equals 6 plus 3, means of course that the choice of path, 6, determines the later metaphysics, 3. This formulation will cause an associative idea of the behaviour of people who have chosen, often without being conscious enough, a certain path, a certain course of action, and thereby are forced to look for metaphysical data in the future for the benefit and in justification of their activities, prompted to this partly by the need to maintain self-esteem, part of the desire to defend their dignity over others. The fourth deconstruction, 9 equals 4 plus 5, is interpreted as the fact that it rises from the plane of the elements, 4, to the astral plane, 5. The magician is proud of his astral science, but he prudently prudently compares the manifestations of his will, not only with astral influences, but also with the conditions, the knowledge of which he owes to psychic, to physics, <laughs> chemistry, astronomy, physiology, etc. Do not hesitate to delay a magical ceremony, if it can be performed later with greater success. Do not act when you feel sick. Consciously apply to your life the hygienic measures of physical purity, bathing, feeding with fresh produce, abstaining from all artificial food and drink. You know perfectly well that excessive fatigue caused by work is as harmful as laziness. If you are sensitive to climatic conditions, carefully choose the right place to live and lastly, always and everywhere, behave according to the theory of probability, what we call being prudent in the physical plane. There are cases of individual implementations playing the role of rivets or nails in the general mechanism of systematic work. It is important to hammer these nails at a certain moment, regardless of physical difficulties and from the seemingly untimely work in terms of the elements. This is necessary and we are launching the active Mars of our astrology even if the achievement of the goal was worth the loss of enormous quantities of vitality or material means. The inverse deconstruction, 9 equals 5 plus 4, gives us the formula 
intelligently applicable only in exceptional isolated cases and that usually bring short-term results. This formula means that as the individual, the influence of the elements and sometimes in opposition to them is given primacy. It can be applied in cases where in order to proceed with the planned work, we need a given strength. It is important that this commitment be made at that very moment, despite physical difficulties and unfavorable conditions at the elemental level. Being necessary, we activate the Mars of our astral, although this operation costs us great loss of vital forces or material resources. In the Ninth Arcanum, despite the importance of double decompositions, the central place should be left behind the systematic, the symmetric triple decomposition, nine equals three plus three plus three. If double decompositions have given us the definition of initiation and indication of the means to achieve it, then this triple decomposition will determine the hierarchical steps of the initiation itself. In the initiatory scale, we discern three cycles and in each of them, three subdivisions, that is three degrees. To the lower cycle, under certain conditions, we will call physical because in general, the initiate or candidate for initiation appears in his physical body at the ceremony of initiation and the ceremony itself is made in a particular place and of three dimensions, being led by an incarnated initiator. In the composition of physical initiation, three elements come into play. The mental, the content of so-called initiation notebooks or the initiation formula already transmitted. The astral, fluidic magnetic influences transmitted by the initiator to the initiate and the initiation symbolism. And thirdly, the physical, all the manipulations that accompany the act of initiation. Finally, the physical is the totality of manipulations in the physical plane that accompanies the act of initiation. The dogmatic content of the youngest of the physical degrees is the synthesis of theogonic, andronic and cosmogonic views of the school, toned up by the normal scheme of the great drama of the human fall and the methodology of human rehabilitation. The second degree will familiarise the initiate with the astral plane, give him the opportunity to make correct judgments about it, the theory, and teach him how to influence his plan without leaving his own physical body, part of psychurgy and all ceremonial magic. The cycle called by his physical contains three degrees. The third physical degree will introduce the initiate into the field of universal love through ethical hermeticism. All three three degrees can be achieved without the participation of the incarnate initiator. To do this, it is enough to have a certain intellectual and ethical development, which partly depends on the number of previous incarnations of the subject, and moreover, have a certain astral protectorate. Of course, I do not need to mention the need for a steady, well-established desire for initiation. Thus, under certain conditions, in the initiation of this cycle, the presence of another human being outside the self-initiating is not mandatory. In other words, the intelligent contemplation of nature, accompanied by meditation, and in parallel of a progressive self-knowledge, are sufficient. Because of this, it is sometimes said that the physical cycle of initiation is given to us by nature, the third link of the theosophical ternary. The element of the astral fluid influence of the initiator on the initiate is reduced to the process of the effects of the will of the initiator on the astral body of the student in the forms of such arrangement for self-processing in the initiatory direction, i.e. to the acquisition of certain degrees of intuitiveness and activity neutralized by spiritual harmony. I don't have to speak about the symbolism and ritual features of the initiation. These are elements determined by the spirit of one or another school, the trends of one or another era, and sometimes personal tastes of the initiates.
We can now turn to the second cycle of initiation, which I will allow myself to call astral, because it, its characteristic is the need for the initiate to exteriorize in the astral zone, and in this form enter into communication with the teacher or teachers. The teacher initiator with whom the neophyte comes into purely energetic contact, already essentially independent of the gross idea of time and unable to coordinate in the space of three dimensions, can either be an exteriorized person or a two-plane elementary of the human essence. In any case, the teacher here will be a certain personality, which will give me the right to say that the second initiation cycle is given to us by the universal astral man. Of course, one should not speak here of the nature of this initiation or of its ritual. We cannot. We note, however, one very important circumstance. The student's traditional Rosicrucian astral trial, accompanied by those who went there before him, the exit so gracefully symbolised in physical terms by the initiation ceremony in the 18th Scottish degree of Freemasonry for its ceremonial and by Christian baptism for ideological significance, should take place in one form or another, no later than the gap between the third highest degree of the physical cycle and the first youngest degree of the astral. Turning to the degrees of the higher cycle, which I allow myself to call mental, I will characterise it as a simple attachment of a human being to the stream of ideas, that stream of ideas, the affinity for which is naturally determined by the type of its monad. There is no more here the astral personality of the instructor performing the act of initiation. Here, simply, the collective universal man accepts into his body a cell that belongs to him right from the beginning of eternity, cleansed of the contamination of the fall and returning to its place with a reserve of acquired wisdom. Of course, the question of the content and ritual of the initiation also disappears. We can say, however, that it is made possible by the existence of the process of the emanations of the archetype a process that caused the principle of the existence of the universal collective man in its primordial purity. It is customary to say that at this initiation a person is exteriorized in the so-called mental body, that is, in that thin astralized shell of the spiritual monad which is inherent in, its, in it even at the stage of its organic communication as cells of the collective man with its other cells. If the process of the Rosicrucian astral baptism was placed between the lower degree of the astral cycle and the highest physical level, then the phase of the so-called Rosicrucian reintegration should be placed between the higher degree of the astral cycle and the lower mental level. Reintegrated brothers of the cross rose, the rose cross, refers to the elementaries, although, may, although they may have retained the middle astral shell, but they can separate from it just like embodied people can exteriorize in the astral body. The reintegrated Rosicrucian seems to temporarily lull the middle astral zone, that is, voluntarily renouncing energetic manifestations, limiting his or her activity to mental manifestations peculiar to the Adam cell before the fall. Just as during exteriorization we voluntarily renounce sensory perceptions in order to cast off slavery from time and space of three dimensions. But we use exteriorization for operations in the physical plane on the basis of mediumistic manifestations, simultaneously vampirizing the lower astral of other organisms and their physical bodies. The reintegrated brother of the Rose Cross can take advantage of mental exteriorization for borrowing forms of the middle astral to create evolutionary astral cliches outside the scope of his usual activities in the middle astral. For example, to complement the dedication of the astral nature of some chain or other, some chain other than his own mid astral Egregorian Mercury. You might ask, can an embodied person be mentally initiated? Yes, it is possible, 
because exteriorization in the mental body is possible with catalepsy of the physical body and most of the astrosome. This is ecstasy. But how short it is for an embodied person and how difficult it is to carry the minced crumbs of a reintegrating mentality into our physical world that are not distorted in essence. <laughs> People who achieve this are called masters. Both ignoramuses and initiates inevitably distinguish them from the crowd, considering them as messengers of the higher plane, that is, recognising the obligation for them to live not for themselves, but for us, and thereby mentally, figuratively taking away their physical body and all lower astral subplanes, unnecessary to the reintegrated brother of the Rose Cross. This is how we treat the prophets, so we may relate to many teachers of the initiative schools, initiated schools, correcting our requirements with the anomaly created by the high impulses of the mentally baptised non-corporeal brothers. One more observation. The mental cycle of initiation takes place by itself within the human being. Here there can be no question of wanting or accepting something because in the process of reintegration, the pentagram loses its personal character. Desires and passions disappear, yielding the work of one of the cells of the universal collective man, consciously participating in their volitional, volitional impulses in a particular field of their organism. In the astral initiation, the initiate of the pentagram has the right not only to want, but also to demand the initiation, just as a rhombus has the right to be credited to parallelograms via the process of accessing the definition of such. That's a maths teacher for you. Here, the will of the initiator must submit to the logic of the initiate. Another thing in the physical cycle. There, the teacher's knowledge of the degree of development of the student is complicated by the complexity of the divination processes and the dependence of the teacher's intuition on the moment at which he operates and on the degree of interest that causes him to meditate on objects that are outside the question of initiation of this person. Here, Acquaintance with the student takes place gradually, not by order, and it is important that the invitation to the initiation comes from the teacher. The consent or disagreement of the student serves as a good control apparatus of the master's intuition. When the latter is mistaken and risks harming the initiation, the student often relieves himself of danger by refusal and the master eliminates the spot on karma. But again, I repeat, it is possible and desirable to initiate without a master, whose role is mainly to state the fact of initiation. I will say a few words about the meaning of the physical cycle of initiation. Of course, astral initiation is more important than physical because its cultivation prepares the process of reintegration. But it is possible to imagine a period of time, even an entire era, during which due to the unpopularity of occult teachings or the presence of a worldly, so to speak, anti-sanctuary character, no one will have hermetic virtues to achieve at least the lower astral degrees. You will say, it does not matter. This era will pass and the initiates will appear again. This is so, the initiates will appear, but the abandonment of occultism for a whole era the oblivion of symbols and the methods of initial preparation will greatly complicate these initiates' influence on their modern society and, at best, will force them to develop again methods of preparing students, elementary symbolism that allows a multi-stage interpretation of elementary techniques of training, the mechanism of application of initiatory discipline, etc. If, on the contrary, the great train chain of traditions does not break off, existing continuously, even if only within the physical cycle of initiation, there will always be a group of guardians of tradition, so to speak, archival watchmen and faithful chroniclers of the history of esotericism, who are not always deeply versed in the occult, 
but continuously observing the system of connections between the external Masonic and deeply esoteric manifestations of mankind. It is for this reason that all historians and supporters of esotericism have always given great value to the physical cycle of the initiation, to the specific characteristics of their respective degrees and to the transmission system of initiation by succession. In the second half of the 18th century, 1760, a current arose which, by the name of its founder, Martinez de Pasquale, should be called Martinezism, but is better known under the name of Martinism, thanks to the works of the philosopher theurgist Claude de Saint Martin. The school of Martinez Pascalis was presented in the form of a powerful magic chain of a somewhat modernised Rosicrucianism, and therefore I will postpone a more detailed mention of it until the 11th Arcanum. As for Louis Claude Saint Martin, he allowed the then unusual and somewhat contrary to the views of his teacher Pascalis, institution of free initiation, which makes it possible to continuously transmit the three elements, mental, astral, physical, of the cycle of physical initiation, regardless of the existence of sororities, fraternities, circles, and other types of Masonic confraternities. At the initiation of Louis Claude de Saint Martin, there was only one degree, um, the, the unknown superior, superior in conferred to the highly evolved and prominent intellectual type called men of aspiration. The two later in innovations of the Martinist order, uh, the degrees of associate and initiate, were only preparatory subgrades, subgrades of disciples, facilitating a careful and well-considered choice of the future superiors. Louis-Claude de Saint Martin divided humanity into four categories. One, men of the torrent, seemed to him in that category of weak-willed, poorly individualised people, following the fashion of this moment and the spirit of this era, which so tormented by, ex by its existence every thinker, philosopher and every conscious progressive figure. Two, men of desire, or those who seek the absolute truth and work consciously and perseveringly for their self-improvement through the contemplation of nature, the penetration into their own heart and study of the sources of tradition. Three, new men, or those who, having reached a certain degree of astral development, no longer therefore subject to the same mistakes as man of aspiration, even the most sincere, not to judge himself or his neighbour. Four, spirit men, or those who have totally gone beyond the attraction of the physical plane and who are liberated, with this, from the slavery of the soul sphere, reaching the full awareness of its higher origin in the spheres of emanations. It is easy to see that the man of desire corresponds in our terminology to the initiate of the degree of the physical cycle, since he already knows where he came from and where he goes, that is, he has understanding of the fall and human reintegration. The new man, already knowing the astral, enters the second degree of the same physical cycle and the man spirit who underwent an elemental emetic transformation in the third. Let us return to the arithmetic deconstruction of our arcanum and analyse another formula, 9 equals 2 plus 4. It is not difficult to read it. Initiation, 9, leads to the great arcanum, that is, its mental part, 3, astral, 2, and elemental, 4. It is interesting to note that a minor change in this distribution gives the general method of training and the process of self-initiation. Then there is 9 equals 2 plus 3 plus 4, putting the component figures in their order of magnitude. The number 2 is the number of polarity. The idea of polarity is closely linked to the idea of attraction, magnetisation and so on. We will have in it the first recipe. By the powerful aspiration of a true man of desire, for his ardent prayer magnetises the environment and from this he will attract to himself the three individualised elements which may facilitate his initiation. 
Among the elements thus attracted, those who are superior make his protectors, and the inferiors will be accessible to his vampirism, that is, they may be for him assimilated. The number three, which symbolises the balanced ternary, androgynous by its composition, but which can be manifested both in the active field and in the passive field, indicates the need for the condensation within us of everything that has already been attracted and assimilated. This process is carried out by means of increasing or decreasing, alternately, and as the case may be, the activity or passivity potential of the subject, or rather, its astrosome, for the purpose of establishing a state which will be the third element in the aforementioned binary of potentialities. After this comes number four. This is a symbol of the elementary rota, the symbol of the applications in the dense plane. It is the outline of the constructive work of the adept who knew how to evolve sufficiently by the process to deepen in oneself and by the training of his personality. This corresponds to what the Masons, in the ritual of the master's degree, so appropriately called the journey to spread the light, resembling the master in the rising sun, culminates, sets and continues his way down the next day, a new cycle of movement, a new quadruple phase of the 24 hour daily route. This four is an allusion to the emanation phase of magical development of the future instructor. Let us return to the card of our arcanum to meditate on its elements. <laughs> the long one. The Elder's Lantern is usually called the Light of Hermes Trismegistus. Hermes is the personification of the harmonious system uniting metaphysical wisdom, knowledge of the astral and science on the physical plane, a system that flourished in the shrines of ancient Egypt. This lantern is indispensable to the initiate and expresses the thesis, do not despise the profane physical world, study the astral plane with assiduity and develop, elevate oneself by the mental to the transcendent level. You are a tri-plane being, study all three planes. The mantle that isolates the old man is called the mantle of Apollonius of Tyana, the famous teacher of the school of Alexandria. It is the symbol of the self-determination of the monad on the mental plane, the self-knowledge on the astral plane, and solitude on the physical plane. Determining yourself on the mental plane means becoming clearly aware of one's role as a cell of the mental organism of the universal collective man, and of all the colourful nuances of that paper. Astral self-knowledge, a path typical of the development of Apollonius, is to develop into the astrosome itself, to make its analysis, a scrupulous classification of its resources, a reorientation, so we can say, of their molecular magnets, and finally, carry out a general synthesis as well, as well, well assimilated. Apollonius's biographers present this work quite well, of a great magician, wrapped in a fleece of wool, concentrated on contemplating his own navel. <laughs> Let us consider the meaning of solitude. What does it mean to be lonely? It is the capacity of work to meditate without allowing the intrusion of energetic influences from other pentagrams. One can be lonely in the midst of a crowd. However, in the early stages of development, many need an anchorite life and effective isolation on the physical plane. This procedure has its good and bad aspects. The good side of the life of a hermit consists of the following. On the mental plane, prayer becomes easier. In the astral plane, there is the possibility of purification by prolonged silence, one of the three recommendations of the Pythagorean school. On the physical plane, there is no loss of time with the concerns of everyday life. The negative aspects of the hermit's life are these. On the mental plane, the inability to observe the progress of fellows in the metaphysical field. In the astral plane, a certain absence of support of the chain of people united by the same evolutionary um, tone. This increases the danger in moments of passivity 
of falling temporarily under the influence of the lower astral. This influence on the physical plane often takes the form of sexual manifestations called incubi and succubi. Elementals and even wizards externalized, having made a mediumistic loan from the hermit or the organic realm surrounding them, can materialize in a sufficiently condensed state to perform coitus with the hermit, the succubus of the astral entity, um, or the incubus of the astral entity. Incubuses and succubuses naturally cause great damage by the physical weakening they cause in their victim, and also because they prepare conditions that, in the future, may facilitate to the hermit the creation by their own will and under various pretexts of any kind of larvae. There is an alternative that removing the evil aspects of the life of a hermit at the same time preserves the good. In other words, an alternative that seeks to neutralise the binary life of a hermit, the binary life of a hermit, life in society. Attempts have been made, still in term, the monastic um, coexistence. The success of the work in these institutions is varied and depending on the season, the environment, the members and the leaders of these communities, discipline and other conditions. The elder staff, as a symbol of prudence, almost dispenses with comment. The essentials have already been said previously. Concluding the analysis of Arcanum 9, we will outline a short programme of efforts that facilitates the self-initiation and prepares the initiation itself. We will list nine phases of these efforts, emphasising that they are usually carried out in parallel and non-consecutively. 1. Overcome physical cowardice. 2. Overcome physical indecision. 3. Overcome regrets about what has been done and cannot be changed. 4. Fight as much as possible against superstition. 5. Fight as much as possible against prejudice. 6. Fight to the maximum with conditions. <laughs> 7. Maintain health and the internal environment in good order. 8. Realise also the astral order, both in itself, the harmony of the soul, and outside of itself, that is, to acquire the empirical knowledge of the entities of the astral plane and its manifestations, classifying them properly. 9. Perform a mental order, that is, achieve purity, clarity and certainty in your worldview, but also the full awareness of its emanation from the archetype. The pentacle of the ninth arcanum is realised according to the scheme 9 equals 3 plus 6, that is, it can simply boil down to the depicting the, the upper two parts of what we call the great arcanum. There are, however, attempts to introduce another configuration, a set of nine points, of which the first three are located as the vertices of an evolutionary triangle, giving two reflections of an involutive type. Six more points. That's the hermit. <laughs>